you can create the 001 NFT which authenticates your piece. But then you authorize another 10 and you let me buy one of those so I can actually own an image, the real thing, the one of a kind dial to create watch NFTs. All right, let's talk about watches then, because I, I always found that I always liked it. I mean, from when I was a kid, I always liked the, the look of um, either on, on some people, you'd see the classic leather strap. Um, and some people, I, li I love seeing, you know, like that traditional steel sub look that, you, that became so like, I, I love that look. There we go. What do we got? Is that what we're in here? Yeah, white it. face Daytona, black, you know, dial. That's the classic steel white face Daytona with a red band, my signature red band. The band is nice, man. Are you a fan of like a Richard Milde? Do you get yes. like those and you get some of those crazy ones too? Yeah, you know, right now I would say, you know, if we're going to go down the rabbit hole on watches, there are two, there are two uh, living watchmakers that have reached Picasso status. Um, Roger Smith and F.P. Journe. And they make watches by appointment. Uh, Jorn is um, a legend, a living legend. Imagine if you could have a Michelangelo be alive and come and paint a dial for you. That's who he is. He only makes 900 pieces a year. There are thousands of people waiting to get one from him. They appreciate by 400% the minute they walk out the store. If you ever flip one, you never get to buy another one from him. It's, you really have to prove you're a collector to join the Journe Society. It's crazy stuff. But, and I've got a lot of Journes. And, you know, to me, it has nothing to do with telling time. I, somebody said to me, how can you even tell the time on that watch? I said, I don't. This is a piece of art. This is, it's a piece of art and it's appreciated in value just like art does. So my watch collection is up 114% in the last 12 months. Um, I have them stored all around the world and I'm working on a really interesting new deal that I'm funding to create watch NFTs so that, you know, wow. if there's a one of, I mean, to me, I mean, I, if there's anybody going to do it, it's going to be me, me. Nobody knows the collectors like I do. Nobody knows the brands like I do. And I, and I can hire tech guys, which I'm doing. I'm going to call this thing the Wonder Trust. Watch for it. Okay. Yeah. So NFTs, I mean... It's, you know, it was something that I don't even know if it was in the lexicon a year or a little more than that ago. And now it's nonstop. It's all you hear about is all the possibilities of NFT. So you're obviously proponent of that. Yeah. Well, let me give you a reason why. I have a friend. Let's call him Bill. I, I, you know, these collectors don't like to. They're very quiet about their pieces. I went to his home recently and with a lube, I looked at a one of a kind piece. Only one. Only one in the world. Maybe five other people have ever viewed it personally. I'm one of those five. And I said to Bill, look, Bill, can I get a picture of this dial just so I can have it? He said, no, I've never let anybody photograph it for obvious reasons. That's when the whole idea hit. And I said, Bill, why don't we partner up and create an NFT company so that you can create the 001 NFT, which authenticates your piece. That's given, stays with the piece for the rest of its life. But then you authorize another 10 serialized zero one through 10 and you let me buy one of those so I can actually own an image, the real thing, the one of a kind dial. And what's the price? Auction it. I'll pay whatever the world's willing to pay for it. That's where I'm going with this idea. I like the idea a lot. Um, do, are you a fan of Patek's too? Oh yeah. Patek is like, you know, Patek is, 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 if you think about the major brands that you can't go wrong with, Ademar Piquet, Paquet, you know, Piquet, um, or Patek, and then uh, Rolex for sure. I mean, Rolex makes millions of watches, but certain Rolexes are the ones you want to go after. But then you've got the, the you know, you've got the micro brands like Ming. I have a one-of-a-kind Ming. No one's ever heard of Ming. Unless you're a watch collector, then you go out of your mind to see this watch. It was made for Ming. It's a Ming for Ming. And his production manager was a huge Shark Tank fan. I reached out, he's in Singapore, and I said, listen, I've, I've heard a rumor that Ming's making a Ming for Ming. He said, yeah, it's a one of a kind. I said, I'll buy it. And he said, I got to talk to Ming, and maybe Ming will want you to have it. And he did. I have the only one. Wow. Yep. That's pretty awesome. It's, I, I didn't mean, look, I'm, like, I'm giddy like a teenager here now. I'm going to turn that into an NFT. I didn't realize that um, Patek 
did the uh, thing that, I mean, you see from different types of manufacturers, especially like high-end luxury things where you go in the store and you're like, I want to get the, uh, what's the, uh, the green uh, face? Oh, green. the Nautilus. You're talking yeah. about the 5711, which just got, you know what happened? The 5711, the classic blue dial was this, that was the entry level Patek and it exploded. I mean, maybe you bought it for 30 grand. The minute they canceled it, I think it went to 150,000. Now, I'm lucky to have a 5711, but they also have the last of the 5711, which is a green-faced version of the same Nautilus. And grown men are weeping to get one. Yeah, I, I love that watch. But I didn't yeah. realize that when, you, when I was in this, in, the, in this store, they go, oh, you have to own other ones for us to even like, get you that one. I was like, oh. Okay. Let me tell you something. The chance that you'll own that watch is zero. Cool. Just to, put you, to set you up. You're going to have to deal with all the collectors around the world that have millions of dollars of Pateks ahead of you. That's yeah. the thing you've got to understand. Patek understands the value of their collectors. And there's something else you should know. Patek has a relationship with royal families all around the world. They don't talk about it. But certain royal families, when a child turns 18, what do you think they get? A one-of-a-kind Patek. Wow. So when you think of um, your collection... And, and like the, you know, the magnitude and the value of it, ultimately, as you get older, is it something you go, I want this to my kids? Is it something you'd want auctioned off? Is it something you wanted shown, like a museum style? What's like your ultimate dream for your watch collection? Yeah, I've been asked that so many times, including from Philips, which is the world's number one watch auctioneer. They do a, a, every fall a huge uh, you know, charity auction, which I participate in, and also they auction watches. I've told my family that's always rating, including my wife who loves to wear all my watches and my daughter and son. I say, listen guys, um, all of these are coming in my coffin with me. I'm not awesome. leaving anything. <laughs> and so, and the reason I'm gonna need all this is I'm going to a place where it's a really, really long time we're talking about it. I'm gonna need really good watches. And my wife said to me, don't worry, Kev. I'll bury them in the case. Don't worry. <laughs> So your collection is hundreds of watches, I'm assuming, or maybe even more. I, you know what I've learned? Because I've had two heists over the decades. And so I no longer disclose how many or where. And I have a very complex um, inventory control system, a really complex insurance system in place. But that's why I'm so motivated, along with several other collectors, to start this NFT company. Because all of us that have these massive collections are going to create these NFTs in association with giant insurers because we, we want the manufacturer to authenticate our serial number and we want the insurer to insure based on location. But you know, my watches, they'll never be a heist again because they're in so many different countries and so many different vaults all over the place. Well, congrats on that. You know, my, uh, one of my agents worked out like a really good deal for me on something. And, um, and then when I was talking to him, he was like, how happy are you with this deal? I go, very happy. And he goes, cool, you're going to buy me a watch. And I was like, what? <laughs> and he goes, yeah, I'm a collector. So that's, your, that's what you're going to do. Not, like, so easy okay. to, not so easy to get watches these days. As an asset class, they've exploded to the upside. Even, for example, the, uh, recently uh, a standard $6,000 Rolex, just you know, the, the entry-level Rolex, they put out a bunch of colored faces. One of them was a coral red face on a $6,000 perpetual. And Kanye was seen wearing it at a basketball game and gave it to his soon-to-be-divorced wife, I guess, Kim Kardashian, on television. The watch exploded. It just, every woman wants this 41 millimeter entry-level coral red. It's just insane. Now. Well, That's I noticed, the kind of thing that happens. I went to, I was in Vegas a few weeks ago. And, you know, walking through one of the nice casinos and they have every type of store. And I, wa I went into the like one of the high-end jewelry stores, just, you know, looking at watches. They ha their inventory was abysmal. Like they had like two of these and two of these. And I'm like, where else do you have? They, don't, like, this they don't have any watches in retail. There, there are none. You're going to have to deal with your representative. And, you know, Rolex is sold out. Patek sold out. Edmar Piquet is sold out. Even Omega is sold out. Everything's sold out. Okay. Well, good to know, guys. Uh, you got to know someone to get a watch. Now, let me ask you about big, because we're talking about big ticket purchases. One thing that um, a lot of different couples, families talk about is, is when there's a big purchase made, is there a discussion? Personally, I'll just buy something and show up with it. And then my wife's like, how much was that? And I'll be like, it was this much. And then she'll be like, oh my God. 
and I don't, I don't talk about it ahead of time. Um, but some people have lengthy discussions about whether or not a purchase should be made. And I'm wondering if you have an opinion on that. Yeah, it's an interesting observation because I did a book, I wrote a book once that I did a lot of research on called Men, Women, and Money. I ended up writing three of them on this topic. And on that first book, which took, I thought it would take me a couple of months to write, it took me over a year and a half, I did a lot of research with divorce attorneys. And I found out something incredible. It doesn't matter at what you know, economic level you're talking about. 50% of unions break up between five and seven years, not for infidelity. Most marriages can you know, survive infidelity. It changes them somewhat, but they can survive. What they can't survive is financial stress. The, the, the majority of breakups have to do with inconsistencies in one couple's spending habits versus another that puts the family under financial stress. That's why the union breaks up. It's just hard, to, too hard to deal with. Because really a family at the end of the day after seven years is a business. You basically both have to have common goals. You have to save commonly. You can't get into debt too much. And sometimes people are incompatible. They never did any due diligence going into the marriage about that. And so really, you know, when I tell people, look, if you're dating and you're going on your third date, time to start some financial due diligence about your potential partner. In fact, you're getting together for a third time must mean something. And so, you know, it's, it's worth asking. Um, I mean, I, I love the romantic part of any relationship, but at the end of the day, if, if you're losing money and you're putting your partner under tremendous stress and you can't support your kids and your home, you're going to get divorced. Yeah. I mean, I guess you're right. I mean, I, I feel like the um, probably the most stressful time in my own marriage was um, those early years when we were struggling the most. Right. Because you're just it, it keeps you up at night. How are we going to pay for this? You know? Yeah. But, yeah. No, I remember when I got married, I, I couldn't even afford uh, any dinner for our guests or anything. We just ordered in pizza. And I said, listen, stay tuned. I think. I'll figure something out and we'll have a party in a few years when I can afford it, which is basically what we did. But it was really tough for the first four years. Yeah. And those, I mean, for us, God, I, I, I would say the first, the, the first few years were, the, were absolutely the, the hardest. We were living in a terrible neighborhood and in a horrible apartment. And, and, you know, even like when we would, I would, I sold something like this uh, web thing and I got a check for it. It was, like the day before a bill came from the city for like a new tax. And I was like, oh, shit. And it was, you know, thousands of dollars. And like, it felt like you couldn't win. But, you know. You know, on the other hand, if you can make it and you're with the same, you know, partner you had all those years, that's equity you've built in your relationship. I'm still married to my wife, the one that we had no money. And she's never been impressed with money. She just doesn't care. And so, you know, it's not what makes her happy. She just wants to take care of the family and, you know, it's it, it just it, it's really refreshing actually to find that out. I know she didn't marry for marry marry me for money because I didn't have any. So that's good to know. Do you feel like um, uh, when it when it comes to a lot of times when when you're coming up, right? You you think about a, a sum of money as being enough, and you know somebody might say like, oh, you know, you have no money. They go, oh, a million dollars or whatever, and and then you achieve that and you, and and you make many times more of that. People a lot of times look at people that have achieved success um, at a high level and they have, you know, more money than they think they you could ever need or spend. And they go, why do you keep working? And I always think that it's because, well, A, like what else are you going to do? But also because you get the thrill out of the deals and the competition and you know, trying to make it work and seeing it work again. It's not so much that like, oh, I have this much more money now I can buy something. It's like being in the game. Yeah, I, what I, I would say to that, I've tried retirement, you know, most, I've, I've talked to many entrepreneurs that, that have had big liquidity events. I mean, mine was the classic start in the basement, 10 guys, one day we wake up, our company gets sold for $4.2 billion. Um, yeah, I mean, it was, you know, we all showed up the next day back at the office saying, what do we do next? I mean, you know, we, we didn't know anything else except working. And, and even though I, I woke up and said, shit, I'm really rich. And, but it didn't change anything, but I decided, well, maybe I'd like to go around the world and visit every beach. Like just, there's a project. Let's go visit every beach. The ones in Cambodia, Vietnam, north coast of Cyprus, all this stuff, which I did for 36 months. Was that ever boring? Like I was going out of my mind. And, and so I just said, I got to get back in the game. I, I, you know, I got to get back in the game. And, and so I just started doing deals again, not so much as an operator, but as an investor. The people that are successful do not 
pursue money for the greed of it. They, they, they're never successful if they try that. If you're after money because you're just greedy, you, you'll never have any. But if you have a real passion about a business, you'll wake up one day like I did saying, wow, how'd that happen? Because it's, it's the pursuit of personal freedom that is what sets you free. It's, it's that you, you're, you're driving you know, your business because you love it so much you want to compete and then one, you know, one day it's worth a lot of money and somebody buys it. And that sets you free and then you pursue the things that matter uh, to you. Um, and that's what I do. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm very fortunate that every day I, you know, I have this woman I work with named Nancy Chung breaks up my day into blocks and, and every week at the beginning of the week I look at the week and I say, what's this over here on Thursday at three? She says, yada, yada, yada. I said, I'm not doing that. I don't care who they are or what they are. I don't care. I don't want to be rude. Tell them now I'm not doing it. It doesn't interest me. And, you know, it's my time. I'll cry if I want to. And I don't, I don't have to do it. And so I want everybody to get to that place. It's a very fulfilling place to be. That's a, that's, I think that's great advice. I know that um, people ask me about, you know, stand up and I'm, I always tell them that the only thing I know for sure about achieving some success in that field is that you have to have a level of obsession about it, um, especially in the first you know, 10 plus years. Like if, if what matters to you is having success in those years, I've never seen it work. It's just people that are in love with the process of writing and performing and getting on stage. And all those people that were obsessed and didn't care if they couldn't make rent and all their friends were buying their first homes and all this stuff. And you go like, I don't give a shit. I just, I love stand up. All those comics that I know are the ones who achieved success. Yeah, that's a very dark profession. I had a chance to travel um, while shooting a documentary as a cameraman once with a group of stand-ups. A lot of drug addiction, a lot of alcoholism there. Yeah, it's great. Uh, it's a really tough, uh, tough, tough, tough business because you're on at night, you've got a lot of crazy people in the audience, and it just grinds on. Those clubs in L.A. and Chicago, been there, done that. To survive that, you've really got to have uh, some kind of an instinct of, uh, you, just, you know. you got to care so much about what's going on on stage. I mean, because other people, the people do succumb to the drugs and the alcohol and everything, all the temptations of it. But the ones who, like, I consistently go like, yep, that, you know, the, that person's totally made it. They, they cared so much. They were so obsessed with performing comedy that nothing else mattered. And then you know, all of a sudden, 10 and 20 years later, achieving all this great success and people are, you know, it's funny when they, they go, he's an overnight success or like, just came out of nowhere. It's like, yeah, it's I, I'm well aware. 20 years. There are no overnight successes in the comedy space. It's brutal. I, you know, I've always thought that the, the, the best perch would be to get your own night show on television or something, which there's only five or six of. But the, the travel is, the food is terrible. The travel is brutal. I mean, travel, just, the travel is what kills you. It's like yeah. the um, like that old I think I think it was Gene Hackman said it. Um, I, I might be getting it wrong, but he said uh, um, the uh, I act for free. It's the waiting around that you pay me for, you know, on, on movie sets. <laughs> and uh, I feel the same way about stand up. It's like I'll do the show for free. It's all this brutal travel that I'd like to get paid for, you know? Yeah, no, I know that is tough. And. You know, as a result, I think you get to see other people's professions and I enjoy doing that too. If you like that video, wait till you see my next one. Don't forget to click right over here and subscribe.